your i 700 GJ1002 B and C, the latest in a string of Earth-like exoplanets that have been discovered over the past few years. Yet the first exoplanet was detected in 1992. So how do we find so many new Earths every year? The story is one about looking outwards and the many different methods we have to observe and learn about the planets and worlds far beyond ours. Worlds beyond ours that we may never visit, that we may never see the surface of with our very own eyes, but ones that we know exist, ones that we can detect and learn about nonetheless. Ever since I was a child, the great abyss, the worlds beyond, the possibilities in our awe-inspiring universe fascinated. Today, we have the tools to explore the abyss of worlds. However, just a few short decades ago, we had never seen a single exoplanet. However, as technology developed, we managed to see more and more of these worlds. The main methods we really use to observe these exoplanets are the wobble method, the transit method, direct imaging and spectroscopy. Let us cover each of these methods one by one. Also, I kind of wish I had a space themed like shirt for this or something, but the best I have is just like this black sweatshirt, so let's just go with it. Firstly, what are we looking for when we try to detect a planet and determine whether it is Earth-like? Well, the most important is the planet itself. Confirming the existence of a planet is essential after all. However, we are also looking for its density. The reason density is important is because it is easier for life to form on denser planets, like terrestrial planets. The Earth is one example, but also Mars, then gaseous planets like Jupiter or Saturn. The same principles apply to moons, but we do not yet have the technological capacity to detect exomoons. Furthermore, we are looking for the orbit size. This is because we want the planet to be in the Goldilocks zone of a star, named after the Goldilocks story. The planet should not be too close, or it would be too hot, or very likely to be tidally locked, meaning only one side faces the star. However, it cannot be too far, or it will be too cold. We want it to be in the just right zone where it is warm enough for liquid water to exist, the chances of tidal locking low, and the temperatures about right for life to exist. Lastly, we want to learn about the composition of the atmosphere, as signs of gases such as carbon dioxide, oxygen, nitrogen or water vapour in the atmosphere are great signs that life may exist. What we need to realise about finding a planet is two things. It is the fact that planets do not produce light and that they are very small compared to their stars. These facts may seem very obvious but are very important. If you tried to view the Earth from light years away, we would never be able to view it due to the sun's glare. The Earth is only one one thousandth the size of the sun and thus the dimming effect of the Earth passing around the sun would be very little. This made it very difficult for scientists to find planets but there is a solution and it relates to the stars and systems themselves. We always think of gravity as acting in one direction. The Earth pulls us down, right? However, that is not true. Gravity is a force of attraction between two bodies, and each body attracts the other. The reason we never feel this effect in our daily lives is that we are much smaller than the Earth itself. However, with planetary systems, the story is different. For example, both a star and a planet experience a gravitational force with each other. They orbit around each other, or more specifically, a particular center of mass. This center of mass, whether it be within the star itself or outside the star, causes the star to wobble, and we can detect this wobble over time. This technique is appropriately called the wobble technique, and it has helped us determine numerous exoplanets, as well as how far they orbit, their approximate mass, all with some knowledge about gravity and mathematics. However, this method was still not enough to comprehend density or atmospheric composition. There were other methods of detecting planets, such as the transit method. As mentioned, when any planet orbits a star and passes in front of it, some of the light is obstructed, causing a slight dimming in the star's brightness. This method was initially deemed impractical, as orbits of planets can be very long. For example, Earth's orbit is in year. We would have to notice regular dips in brightness to confirm the existence of a planet, which is already difficult enough to notice due to how small planets are. Thus, for years, scientists deemed the transit method impractical. That is, until it was done. In 2001, while looking at the stars in the Sagittarius neighborhood, scientists detected a slight drop in the brightness of a star. The orbit time was also only 29 hours. Thus, 
they were able to determine the existence of a planet using the transit method. Initially, because telescopes were on the ground and had to look through a turbulent atmosphere, it was difficult to spot planets this way and it required long time viewing. However, with the Kepler Space Telescopes, other space telescopes and most recently the James Webb Space Telescope, we started detecting hundreds of exoplanets this way from 2009. Furthermore, the method could also be used to find the size of the planet because the bigger the planet, the bigger the dip in the brightness. In addition, it could also be used to find a planet's mass. These factors enabled us to determine the density of a planet. This density could be used to determine if a planet was a gaseous planet or a terrestrial planet, furthering our quest for looking for new Earths. With these two techniques alone, we have found dozens of Earth-like planets in the habitable zone of their stars, the Goldilocks zone. However, we still have to determine the composition of these planets, specifically the atmospheric composition. To do this, we need to have a spectroscopy of the atmosphere. A spectroscopy can be thought of as an identification tool for elements. Each atom, compound, etc. absorbs certain wavelengths of light and emits others. This produces emission spectra, which can be thought of as barcodes for the elements. To have this occur, we had to move beyond the first two techniques and look at direct imaging. This technique uses a device called a coronagraph to reduce the glare of a star. So far, we can only detect planets who orbit far away from their stars. However, scientists are hard at work at making direct imaging better. To do this, scientists have proposed a device called a star shade, which is a space-faring aerosol or a coronagraph in space. It is in a flower shape, the size of a baseball diamond, and its edges allow the starlight to bend around it prevent the telescope from receiving the star's excessive glare. However, for this to occur, we will need the telescope and the star-shaped flower to line up perfectly, and the large star shape has to be launched in a small aircraft. The scientists are looking towards origami for inspiration to be able to transport such a device. The project has not yet been green-lighted, but it is undoubtable that this will be the next step to finding new Earths, ones with gases like water vapor, oxygen, nitrogen and more that can harbor life. With that, we will continue our quest to find new exoplanets, new Earths, worlds far beyond ours in the great abyss of the universe and one day, hopefully, extraterrestrial life. Thank you.